Amen. All right, church, let's go ahead and turn to 2 Samuel chapter 2. And uh, this morning we are going to look at verses 12 through 32. If your Bible has a caption or a, a subtitle in it, should say the Battle of Gibeon or something similar to that, just depending on what translation of the Bible you have. This is the ESV version. And uh, this is how it reads. Abner, the son of Ner, and the servants of Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, went out from Mahanaim to Gibeon, or Gibeon. And Joab, the son of Zeruel, and the servants of David went out and met them at the pool of Gibeon. And they sat down, the one on one side of the pool, and the other on the other side of the pool. And Abner said to Joab, let the young men arise and complete, or compete before us. And Joab said, let them arise. Then they arose and passed, by, passed over by number. Twelve for Benjamin and Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, and twelve of the servants of David. And each caught his opponent by the head and thrust his sword in his opponent's side. So they fell down together. Therefore, that place was called Helkath Azurim, which is at Gibeon. And the battle was very fierce that day. And Abner and the men of Israel were beaten before the servants of David. And the three sons of Zeruel were there, Joab, Abishai, and Asahel. Now Asahel was as swift of foot as a wild gazelle. And Asahel pursued Abner. And as he went, he turned neither to the right hand nor to the left from following Abner. Then Abner looked behind him and said, Is it you, Asahel? And he said, It is I. Abner said to him, Turn aside to your right hand or to your left and seize one of the young men and take his spoil. But Asahel would not turn aside from following him. And Abner said again to Asahel, Turn aside from following me. Why should I strike you to the ground? How then could I lift up my face to your brother, Joab? But he refused to turn aside. Therefore Abner struck him in the stomach with the butt of his spear, so that the spear came out, came out his, his back. And he fell there and died where he was. And all who, were, all who came to the place where Asahel had fallen and died stood still. But Joab and Abishai pursued Abner. And as the sun was going down, they came to the hill of Ammah, which lies before Gia on that way to the wilderness of Gibeon. And the people of Benjamin gathered themselves together behind Abner and became one group and took their stand on the top of the hill. Then Abner called to Joab, shall the sword devour forever? Do you not know that the end will be bitter? How long Will it be before you tell your people to turn from the pursuit of their brothers? And Joab said, As God lives, if you had not spoken, surely the men would not have given up the pursuit of their brothers until the morning. So Joab blew the trumpet, and all the men stopped and, per stopped and pursued Israel no more, nor did they fight any more. And Abner and his men went all that night through the Arab uh, Arabia, um, they crossed the Jordan, and marching the whole morning, they came to Mahanaim. Joab returned from the pursuit of Abner, and when he had gathered all the people together, there were missing from David's servants 19 men besides Asahel. But the servants of David had struck down of Benjamin 360 of Abner's men, and they took up Asahel and buried him in the tomb of his father, which was at Bethlehem. And Joab and his men marched all night, and the day broke upon them at Hebron. That is the word of the Lord. Amen. I always get a little nervous when there's a lot of names in the passage that you're reading. I think that's every Christian's uh, fear is to have to read names of the Bible publicly. Doesn't matter how many times you read the Bible, how many times you study them. It still trips you up every now and again. I hope I, I did it justice. Uh, today's sermon is on the passage we just read, and we are continuing a topic that we started from last week, and that topic is the topic of sin. Last week, I preached on Abner's sin of opposing God. Um, 
Saul is dead at this point. Now there's a transition in power for the Israelites. God had anointed David through the prophet Samuel to take over when Saul had died. So the time is now and the kingdom, the throne is rightfully David's. But Abner, Abner refuses to bow the knee to David. He refuses to relinquish power. And since he can't take the throne, he gives power to Saul's living brother, Ishbosheth. And so by Abner rejecting David as king and appointing someone else, by the way, who God did not choose, Abner is blatantly disobeying God. See, because he knew the decrees of God, it was made evident to him that it was David who should be sitting on the throne, but he didn't care. He knew the decrees of God. He rejected them for basically selfish gain. He was going to control the throne, the kingdom, through a kind of a puppet type king in Ishbosheth. So we looked at that and we saw how we are like Abner many times. Because we also know the decrees of God. The commands of God, the decrees of God, they're all found in his word. We have the moral law, the Ten Commandments, where God tells us what he requires of us. The Ten Commandments are there to make us aware of our sins. And even though we have them before us, they're not only written in in scripture, they're also written in our hearts. So, so we, that's how we know when we do wrong. Even though we know the decrees of God, we reject them for selfish gain. We know God has said, I command you to do this, but we do this instead because that's what we want. That's what our heart desires. So when we disobey God, or rather when we oppose God, we act in the same way as Abner is acting now. But when we do this, this is, it's sin. There, there's that word again, right? I told you last week, we are sinners because we sin. So there is this word sin where it, it, it communicates and tells us God is displeased with something. And it's shocking how Sin is not talked about in many churches, or it, maybe it is talked about in many churches, but it's glossed over. It's almost as if, oh, it's, it's okay, you, you really didn't offend God with, with this sin. Rather, it's just, it just he, he prefer you not to do it. But when we look at God's word, God says, you shall be as I am, I am holy. And, and he, he requires us to be as he. And so you have this, this paradox of this holy God who requires holiness, but then you also have a loving and merciful and gracious God who is willing to forgive our sins when we come to him in repentance. So although we haven't arrived to where we are perfectly sinless, we are still to strive not to sin. But when we do sin, we, we have a savior. We have a savior who will forgive us our sin, who will bring us back to him and who will help us to pick up the pieces and move on with the call that he has given us. So, but we have to acknowledge that we do sin. When we look at characters in the Bible, we tend to relate ourselves to someone like David or Abraham. Or we can go on and on and on. These, these, these people who, who in, in most cases, they do good things. But then if we look at the same people, we'll see that they had great sin. We're, we're just like that. And I think this is an important topic because sin is, of course, talked about in the Bible. It's, it's a, a foundational truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, when you look at the doctrine of sin which is called hamartiology. That's just a, a, a big word. It fits all under uh, anthropology, which is the study of man, 
Under the study of man, you have the doctrine of sin. And so this whole doctrine is really interesting in that it, it talks about how sin originated. Uh, it talks about the effects that sin has on man. It talks about a whole lot of different things. Uh, the, the term hamartiology actually comes from the Greek word hamartia, which means to miss the mark. And the perfect example of as far as the scripture goes that I can give you is Romans 3.23. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You look at that passage and it's really interesting because there's this claim from God saying all have sinned. Well, why? Why have we sinned? Because we have fallen short of the glory of God. God says, be holy as I am holy. We are not holy as he is holy, so then therefore we have sinned. That word hamartia means to miss the mark. The, 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 the mark for us is perfection. We have missed that mark, so then therefore we have sinned against God. And as I said, this doctrine of sin includes uh, original sin and its effects on everything. Creation. It includes man's sinful nature. And his inability to save himself from the penalty of, penalty of sin, which is death. Uh, this doctrine includes and points us to Christ, who is without sin and therefore the savior of man's soul. And then also it finally includes God's righteous judgment or justice upon sin. For the believer in the form of his divine discipline. For the unbeliever in the form of his divine wrath. Those two things fall under the justice of God upon sin. And today we're going to study the topic of God's discipline for the believer. See the purpose of his discipline is important. We must understand that. And also what happens when a believer does not adhere to the righteous discipline of God. We've all been there. We don't adhere to it right away. So then what happens after that? We'll talk about that. But here's a fundamental truth. And, and if you want a sermon summary or, or to know what we're going to be talking about, it lies here in this statement. The fundamental truth is that sin has consequences. I don't have to tell you. We all know about that. Sin has consequences and they are destructive and they are far reaching. Therefore, God disciplines us to bring us to repentance. There's, there's grace there. Although there is discipline and it's unpleasant, there's still grace there as to the reason why God is doing it. It's to bring us back to repentance, to bring us back, to calibrate us to be who he has created us to be. He has created us for good works, that we should walk in them. And that's what repentance, or that's what discipline does for us. So let's take a look at this battle and, and let's determine how Abner continues to just walk in disobedience to God. And let's see how God interacts with Abner. First of all, in verses 12 through 13, we have this interesting uh, battle. This, this, this whole thing is playing out uh, north of Gibeon. Gibeon seems to be like this central location. So north of Gibeon was uh, Mehanaim, and that's where Abner's army comes from. South of Gibeon was Hebron, and that's where Joab's army comes from. So in verses 12 to 13, we have these two armies, one coming from the north, one coming from the south. And they are without their kings. We have the tribe of Judah, who has just anointed David king, and then you have all the other Israelites who have anointed Ish-bosheth as king. But their kings stay home. Their, their commanders of their armies are the ones who are in charge. They march down to Gibeon. Now, notice it's north against south. We've, we, we, we're familiar with that, right? I'm, I'm, it's interesting to, to, to think about that. What has been is what will be. What has been done is what will be done. For there is nothing new under the sun. That's what Ecclesiastes says. It's like 
the same sins repeated over and over and over. Humanity doesn't learn. And so here we have this army from the north, this army from the south. They come together, they meet in Gibeon. And it's really interesting because when they are there, they sit at this pool and it seems like a peaceful type of meeting. Seems very quiet, actually. And right now, this is not a war that's going on. Rather, it is a conflict that is going on. And they meet in the middle in Gibeon to settle the dispute of who should be king. This is going to determine who takes the throne, either David or Ishbosheth. Now, there shouldn't have been a dispute because God had already made his choice known. Yet Abner and his people oppose God. That's very important. Now, verses 14 through 16, you see this very odd battle take place. It's what I would call a representative battle. And it's similar to what happened with David and Goliath. Those are the only two times that, that I can find in uh, the Old Testament where something like this happened with Israel. Where there was this representative that fought for the whole nation. And so we get the concept where you have a champion that is selected and they go forth that they beat the other champion, then the whole nation, that part of the nation wins, or that group wins. And that's exactly what is happening here. But instead of one-on-one, -on -one, it's 12 on 12. It's like a, it's like a, a I guess, a, a pickup game of, of football. I know it's 11 on 11, but it's sort of like that. But this is like ultimate football, football to the death. And so they get up, they pass before their commanders, and they line up and they're ready for battle, these two, these 12 men, or rather these 24 men. And the winner would determine who got the throne. But notice in verse 17, that after the initial battle ended, it ended in the draw. And that's how you, I don't know, you ask, you look at that and I ask, how can that happen? How can it completely end in the draw? And it, it was one move for each of the champions. They each grabbed each other's head and they each stabbed each other. Boom, they all fell down. Sounds like divine providence to me, doesn't it? So there is no champion at this point. Maybe God is trying to tell the nation something at that point. Maybe the fact is no one's really winning from this fight from this conflict maybe it's a hey, I've already spoken you should just do what I've told you to do maybe I, I I can't make us read into that but it makes me think so it ends in a draw but yet Abner refuses to stop opposing God so then what we see at that point is that this battle between 12 representatives turns into a battle between north and south between judah and, and 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 the rest of israel and so we see in the bible that judah which is joab's army they they deliver a a a, a blow to uh, abner's army and what's really odd is that Abner's army is actually bigger. Remember, remember that, that David and his men, they were only 600 strong. But yet, this was a guy, and this was the, the, this, these were the people that God had chosen. And yet, you see God's spirit empowering them, encouraging them, and helping them in the battle. So they're able to defeat Abner and his, and his men. And it should have ended right there. But it didn't kind of us when we're sinning against God and God puts something in our lives to discipline us and it should end right there, but it doesn't. We continue to find other ways to try to get out of it. We continue to, we love our sin so much that we continue to try to cling on to it. We think, well, God got me this time, but he's not going to get me this next time. So Abner retreats in verses 18 to 23. He's defeated. He retreats. He won't give up. He won't stop opposing God. And Asahel sees him, who is Joab's brother. 
And Asahel wants to put everything to rest. So he pursues after Abner. And Asahel, his goal is to defeat Abner and to end the conflict. This is uh, family against family, brother against brother. And Abner tried to avoid killing Asahel because basically of the potential conflict with Joab and, and even with David. We see that in scripture in verses 18 to 23. And it doesn't seem like Abner meant to kill Asahel because he struck him with the butt of his spear. If he wanted to kill him, he would have turned around and struck him with the, the offensive part of the spear. But he struck him with the butt of the spear. But it's where he struck him. He struck him in the stomach and the blow was so hard that it went through his stomach, came out his back. And everyone was shocked. Verse 23. says, all who came to the place where Asahel had fallen and died stood still. I don't know if you've ever had one of those moments today, September 11th. Um, we all know where we were in September 11th. It seemed like time stood still at that point. We could recollect, we can recall where we were, what we were doing. And, and this is not... Uh, an event on, of that magnitude, but for the people who were there, it was like a shock. Asahel was a great warrior. Joab's brother. He's, he's listed as one of the mighty men of God in the Old Testament. And he died this way. And so when he fell down and died, everybody just was shocked and they looked. They couldn't believe that Asahel had fallen. Then in verses 24 through 33... Joab and his other brother, they go after Abner. And they pursue Abner to avenge their brother. But the, that day ended with no more fighting. Verse 25. This is where Abner goes up to the mountain. And by the looks of it in scripture, Abner had gained the higher ground. He had the advantage as far as, as a tactical advantage. So he's gained the higher ground and he certainly has a larger army. They have united and they are there taking their stand. And here comes Joab with his, whatever's left over of his army. And Asahel calls out to Joab and says, hey, stop, brother, brother, stop. Let's not fight anymore. See, by the providence of God, Abner did not attack Joab and his men. Because if they would have, they probably would have obliterated them. Rather, he called a truce for the day. And what's interesting is that each man went his own way, but the damage had already been done. What do I mean by that? Well, let's talk about what Abner's sin had done, what it caused. Remember, sin has consequences. They are damaging and far-reaching. So let's, let's look at the consequences of Abner's sin. Abner's refusal to submit to David as Israel's king and to stop opposing God was the direct cause of the battle in Gibeon. If Abner wouldn't have done that, there wouldn't have been a battle. Plain and simple. Abner knew the will of God, yet he freely chose to oppose it. As I told you before, Abner, who didn't have the authority from God, anointed Ish-bosheth, king over Israel who was not called by God. These are men making decisions outside of God's word because this is what they think is right in their own hearts. He showed that he did not care what God had said or commanded concerning David's anointing to be king. In essence, Abner was saying to the Lord, I oppose you and I will not obey you. In Abner's disobedience to God, he takes the seat at the throne of his own heart. I think that's what's interesting about it. He's not only taking the throne, not he himself, but he's, he's manipulated. He's, he has who he wants there. He's not only taking the throne of Israel, but he is taking the throne of his own heart. We need to remember that Jesus said to us to take up our cross. He never said to us, to sit down on our thrones. Amen? 
Never. Never did Jesus say that. Never did he say, hey, you are kings and queens. You deserve the best. Uh, find a throne and sit down on it and, and just rule over your own lives. Never, ever said that. Rather, what, what Jesus said was to deny yourself, take up your own cross, and follow me. That's what we are told by Christ. But here, Abner is taking his seat at the throne of his own heart. He's saying, I'm the master of my destiny. I control my life. I will do as I want. Nothing and no one's going to stop me. See, Abner's sin not only affected him, but it also impacted his kinsmen. Those whom he called brothers and sisters in the Lord. That, sound, that should sound pretty familiar to us as we sit here as brothers and sisters in Christ. Within this place, within this room, we are not only brothers and sisters in Christ, but we are also husbands and wives. We're also mothers, fathers, children, grandparents. We, we have these close relationships. Abner's sin affected relationships like ours. In the initial battle at Gibeon, 24 Israelites died. That's when they all went head to head. That representative battle, 24 of them died. Those can be attributed to Abner's sin. But it continues on. In the battle that preceded, eight men from Judah died, including Asahel, and 348 men of Benjamin died. Those can be contributed to Asahel's sin. Do we think about what our sin is doing? Our unrepentant sin is doing to our brothers and sisters in Christ. Do we think about what our unrepentant sin is doing to our family? To those whom we claim to love. Do we ever think about that? Do we look at the destruction it is causing? No, I think sometimes we're a lot like Abner because what's ironic about Abner is that he doesn't see how his sin has divided the nation. He only sees the misdeeds of others. Look at verse 26. At when, when Abner was on top of the hill and Joab was chasing him, Abner said, shall the sword devour forever? Do you not know that the end will be bitter? Like, how ironic is that? Abner's speaking to Joab and he's like, I know I killed your brother, but don't you know that this is going to end in a bitter way because what you're doing is, is, is not of God? How long will it be before you tell your people to turn from the pursuit of their brothers? Joab could have said, how long will it be before you do what is right and what God has commanded you to do? But see, Abner doesn't see his sin. He sees the issues. He sees the sins of others. Abner saw the speck that was in his brother's eye, but did not notice the log that was in his own eye. And Abner seems to have believed that although he was sinning, he was right or his sin was justified. That's a dangerous place for us to be. When we know that what we are doing is sinning and we still think we are right or we think that our sin is justified because someone else has sinned against us. That's you sitting at the throne of your own heart. See, a person reaches that point when they reject what God has commanded to follow the desires of their hearts. We do this in our relationship with God. You say, well, I would worship God and serve him and obey him if God would only do this for me. Like, I, I don't go to church. I don't, I don't associate with other Christians. I don't read the Bible. I don't do any of those things because my life is miserable. It's not fair. And if God would make things better, then I'd start doing those things. And we think I am right in this because this is the way I feel. Rather than trusting in God's word, going to God's word and says through the good, bad and ugliness of life, we are to worship God with all we have. Because through what we are going through, God is bringing about his will. He is using us as his creation and we are growing through that and he's getting the glory through everything. 
Or we do this in our relationships with family. I would treat them better if they would treat me better. I would respect him if he would treat me like a queen. I would treat her like a queen if she respected me. We forget that it starts right here. It starts with us. It's always conditional. We do this in our relationships in our church. I would forgive my brother or sister if they would just come to apologize to me. I would. I would forgive them. Knowing that God's word says we must forgive each other. It is a command. It's not a suggestion. See, we, we, when we get to this point, it's, it's us sitting on our thrones. We're, we're like Abner. We're like, no, this is, I don't want what God wants. I want something different. I, I want to elevate myself. And I'm not happy until this happens. And I'm right. I'm right because it feels right. See, the overall impact of Abner's sin, it, it cannot be calculated. Just like our continued disobedience to God cannot be calculated. The fact is, only God knows and Abner will have to give an account for it all. Even though we cannot calculate it, God can calculate it. And everything we do in the body, the Bible tells us, will be judged by God. I pray for his faith. I pray that his faith was in Christ. Yeah, Abner's faith. I mean, we're all saved through Christ, even the Old Testament, in the Old Testament. I pray that his faith was in the one who was to come. There was a promise in the Old Testament that there, was, there would be a Savior to come. I pray his faith was in that Savior. 2 Samuel chapter 3, verse 1 shows us that his conflict, this conflict here that Abner started, it turned into a long war between the house of Saul and David. That's a passage that we'll preach about next, uh, next Sunday. But this, this small conflict, it all developed from one man's sin. From him opposing God. See, it is extremely difficult to see the damage his unrepentant sin caused to his kinsmen. Wives lost their husbands. Children lost their fathers. When we look at that and compare it to our own lives, compare it to what we deal with every single day, how we interact with people every day, it is tragic to see what sin can do both to the unrepentant sinner and also those he or she claims to love. Some of us are sitting in our consequences right now. Can't take it back. And it, it's, it's out there. It's done. And things will never be the same. And that's okay because we're all in that same boat. We've all sinned. We've all made mistakes. I say it's okay. It, it's, it's not okay against God. But, but it's something that we can all relate to. We've all done it. We've all done something that cannot be taken back. And the wonderful thing is that God is gracious to us. Where, where we do wrong is where we, instead of coming back to the Lord, we stand our ground against God and say, I'm going to continue to oppose you because I still want this. See, my friends, Christ is our only victor against sin. We can't defeat our strongholds on our own. I can't think of anyone in the Bible whose sin only affected them and no one else. Uh, I, even if we relate it to anyone alive, it, I, I've never met anybody where it's like, oh, my sin only affected me. But yet when we're doing it, that's all we're thinking about. We're like, hey, it's, it's, it's my own personal sin. Leave me alone. This doesn't involve you. Oh, well, no, it does. 
We're all one body. Remember that? As I said in the beginning, we must remember that sin has consequences and that they are destructive and that they are far reaching. Some of them go from generation to generation. The consequences of them. The longer we oppose God and our sin, the more destructive and far reaching the consequences are for us and those around us. And that's why I implore you today, we must always check the desires of our hearts against his word. God has given us wisdom. He has put his word in our hearts. Those things are well, those things are good, but we must always check our own desires against what he has commanded. We must always concede the throne of our hearts to God. If our desires and actions are not aligned with his word, then we must acknowledge it is sin. That's step number one. We must acknowledge that it is sin. Just because the world does it, just because the majority does it, just because it's okay with society, it's still sin. God has a higher standard. She's saying amen, and I appreciate that. Or he's saying amen, and I appreciate that. We must repent. John 1, verses 8 through 10. If we say we have no sin, the Bible says we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. See, this verse really makes sense in the light of today's passage. If we say we have not sinned, what does that mean? In other words, if you're in a sin like Abner and you're refusing to see it as sin, it's clearly sin, but yet you've, you've stood your ground and you're like, no, this is not sin because this is, it feels right. So if we are like Abner and, and, and we are refusing to acknowledge it as sin, this is what the Bible says. This is what John is getting at. You make him to be a liar. You make him to be a liar. Because what you're saying is, no, my truth is true. God, what you have told me is true is not true because that's not what I'm going to follow. You make it to be false. You make him to be a liar. It's one or the other. It's either we're the liar or God is. Bible says, let him be true and every man a liar. So if we say we have not sinned, we're like Abner, we make him to be a liar. And it says, and his word is not in you. Meaning you are not being led by his word, rather you're being led by the flesh. If you're doing something that opposes God, his word's not in you. Does that mean the spirit of God is not in you? No, not exactly. It just means you're not focused. You're not, you're not focused on following the word of God. You're not focused on relenting. You're focused on the throne of your heart rather than that being the seed of God. See, for the believers, the consequences of your sin are discipline from the Lord. That's what's, that, that's, that's part of the good news of the gospel. I know the gospel is, yes, you're sinners in need of a savior and your savior has come and saved you from your sin. That is awesome. That is great. But the gospel is so rich that it continues even after that. And it tells us that God loves us so much and that he is sure to complete the work he has started in us, that he disciplines us for our good. And so for the believer the consequence that you are going through right now, even though those consequences are so difficult, they seem so harsh. It is discipline from the Lord. He is treating you as sons and he is guiding you back to him. That's what the Bible says. Hebrews chapter 12 says, for what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline, then basically it says you are illegitimate children. 
Because that means God doesn't care about you. But yet he does care about you. Because when you sin against him, he disciplines you. It says, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us. And we respected them for it. I know none of us did when it happened. But afterward, we're like, I understand why my parents disciplined me. And, and, and the passage continues. Shall we not much more be subject to the father of spirits and live? For our earthly fathers, they disciplined us for a short time. They did it imperfectly. They did it as seemed best for them. Oh, but he, he, the, 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 the father, our father in heaven, he disciplines us for our good. That we, this is, the, this is the important part here, that we may share his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 7 through 11. I read a quote the other day and I really liked it from John MacArthur. Why is discipline important was the question. This is what he said. Discipline teaches us to operate by principle rather than desire. That's great. That's what God is teaching us. He's like, uh-uh-uh. That's not your heart. That's my heart. That's not your throne. That's my throne. You don't do what you want. You do what I've commanded. When you do what you want, and it goes against what I've commanded, you sin against me. My expectation is that you, my command is that you repent of that sin. If you don't, I'm going to discipline you. I'm going to humble you. If you're my child, you will cry out to me. If you're my child, you will let go of that sin. You're my child, you will bow the knee to me. For those who are not believers, the consequence of your sins are judgment from the Lord. Rather, the consequence of your sins are wrath from God. Even your life now. The Bible says that you are storing up wrath for yourself at this point. See, for those who don't believe, he is exposing your corrupted heart and he is calling you to faith and repentance in him. Second Peter chapter three, verses nine through ten say this. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness, but he is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come. Like a thief. And the heavens will pass away with a roar. And the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved. And the earth and the works that are done in it will be exposed. See, one way or another, God is, God is dealing with your sin. Either through discipline because you're his child and he's bringing you back to him. Or in the form of you storing up wrath for yourself for the day of judgment. You know what's really neat? Either way, you're alive today. You're still breathing. God's providence has brought you to this very place right now. You're hearing this message. There's also the work of the Holy Spirit who's doing a much better job than I am right now. In fact, his, his preaching is perfect. He's, he's speaking to your hearts through what I've prepared and through what I read through God's word. Either way, I, I want to tell you, today is the day of salvation. I want to tell you, let go of the sin that entangles you. And I want to tell you to respond to him with faith 
and repentance. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this time together.